It took a long time for Xenoblade Chronicles 2 to grow on me. It's only after playing the game twice that I truly appreciate it. And I now realize I've been playing these games all wrong. Because Xenoblade 2 is a great game, but only if you're willing to put in the effort. This game is not to be taken lightly. Fair warning, this video will have massive spoilers for pretty much every aspect of Xenoblade 2, but I'm not gonna spoil any of the other games in this series. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is a Japanese action RPG set in an epic sci-fi world, released in 2017 for the Nintendo Switch. It's a direct sequel to 2010's Xenoblade Chronicles, although the two games take place in different worlds and feature different casts of characters. While there is a connection between the two titles, it's more like an easter egg than a part of the core story. And Xenoblade 2 can be played as a standalone game without really missing out. Still, players of the first game should feel right at home with Xenoblade 2. And the core gameplay remains very much the same. You form a party of three characters, although you only directly control the party leader. You explore large open-world areas, fight monsters in real-time battles, and customize the heroes with rewards you buy from shops, loot from enemies, or earn from quests. While the basic formula is still there, a lot of the details are different. And for the most part, the changes feel like improvements. And the biggest improvements are found in the area of the game where you'll be spending most of your time. Xenoblade 2's playable characters are drivers, humans who form lifelong bonds with artificial beings known as blades, which can take the shape of anything from a cute girl to a hideous monster. A driver can engage up to three blades, but only one takes the field at the same time. Different blades have different strengths and weaknesses, where Xenoblade 1 assigned different characters the roles of tank, healer, and attacker, the attributes and abilities of Xenoblade 2's drivers are determined by the weapon type of their currently equipped blade. Which means you can now change the character's role in the middle of combat. Battles in the Xenoblade series use a real-time command-based system that draws a lot of inspiration from the MMO genre. You can move around freely on the battlefield and your characters will auto-attack as long as the targeted enemy is within range but the real purpose of auto-attacking is to recharge the character's driver arts. Powerful attacks with added effects like healing, extra aggro, or enemy debuffs. Driver arts are now mapped to different buttons on the controller, which removes the need to cycle through the first game's clunky arts palette. Attacks that are more effective when used from the enemy's side or rear lock the bonus in when you activate the art. So even if the enemy moves after you hit the button, you're still good to go. And break combos now come with four steps. Break, topple, launch, and smash. And completing a combo feels incredibly satisfying. The biggest change to combat is probably the introduction of blade combos. Instead of the character-specific talent arts from the first game, Xenoblade 2 has blade specials. Big, splashy moves where the driver tags in their blade to deliver a devastating blow. By linking together a series of increasingly powerful specials of the right combination of elements, you can pull off a blade combo, a savage finisher that does massive damage and applies an elemental orb of the same element as the final attack. Just like in the first game, Starting a chain attack turns Xenoblade 2's real-time combat into a turn-based experience. You still get to pick the character's actions one by one, but this time, chain attacks are all about blade specials, and the true objective is to shatter the elemental orbs you've applied to the enemy by hitting them with attacks of the opposite element. Every time you shatter an orb, you get to extend the chain attack by another round, and with just the right setup and a fair bit of planning, a well-timed chain attack can pretty much one-shot even the game's bosses. The pieces of Xenoblade 2's combat system come together in a very satisfying way. Cancelling attacks at just the right moment lets you mount a relentless offense. Timely blade switches help you keep combos alive, and constant on-screen button challenges force you to stay on top of the action. Battles come with a clear goal, 
And once you have all of the game's most important features unlocked, fighting is fun, fast-paced and feels amazing. The only problem is getting to that point in the first place. Xenoblade 2's combat starts really slow. Auto attacks are all you have to begin with, and even when you get your first driver arts, you'll spend most of your time waiting for them to recharge. It's quite a while before you can engage more than one blade per driver, and you won't have access to chain attacks until something like 10 hours into the game. Early battles feel slow, enemies take a long time to die, and fighting can get kind of tedious. Combat really only clicks towards the back half of the game when you've unlocked all of the most important features, had a chance to customize your party, and learned how combat actually works. With three blades per driver, some pouch items to speed up your arts recharge, and the ability to cancel attacks into each other, combat goes from slow and boring to fast and furious. Eventually, you'll be spamming driver arts while cycling your blades to lock the enemy into endless driver combos and building towards a game-ending chain attack. When it's good, it's really good. At least, that's how I felt about my second playthrough. Because Xenoblade 2's combat suffers from one major problem. And to explain it, we need to talk about the first time I played the game. On my first playthrough, it took me the whole game to really get Xenoblade 2's combat system. The second time I played the game, I had a blast right out of the gates. And the difference was knowledge. Because Xenoblade 2 is so much more fun when you understand how combat works. Xenoblade 2's combat system seems really simple at first, but there's actually a lot to learn. It's not that any individual combat mechanic is all that complex. The problem is, the game does a pretty bad job of teaching you how to fight. Tutorials are brief, and the information you get can be really confusing or outright misleading. And even when the game does a decent job of teaching the basics, it often leaves out a lot of the details you need to get the big picture. The perfect example is fusion combos. Basically, starting a driver combo while you're in the middle of a blade combo, or the other way around, will result in a fusion combo. Fusion combos give you a lot of great benefits, like bonus damage and a boost to the party gauge. And there's even something called a joint combo finish, which is when you strike the final blow to an enemy using a fusion combo for a huge bonus to XP. But fusion combos and joint combo finishers are both things the game doesn't even tell you about. And it's far from the only thing Xenoblade 2 forgets to teach you. There's a lot of stuff I never understood about Xenoblade 2's combat on my first playthrough. And some of those things are pretty fundamental. I never got that you can reset the timer on a blade combo by hitting the enemy with a driver combo. I had no idea you can see the current level of your ally's specials by looking for the tiny white orbs that circle their portraits. I didn't even realize you can only get one extension per round in chain attacks, even if you burst multiple orbs. You could figure these things out on your own, but it's often hard to get proper feedback from the game's interface. Blade specials and driver arts look cool, but they're also really flashy. Drivers, blades and enemies take up a lot of the screen's real estate, and there's all kinds of explosions flashing lights, and constant floating damage numbers cluttering up the feed. It's not a big deal when you're face rolling trash mobs, but it can be pretty hard to tell why you just died in a difficult fight. Especially when some of the game's bosses hit you with a totally new mechanic you've never even seen before. The game is notoriously hard to beat if you haven't mastered the game's combat or done a lot of optional content. And casual players often end up on Google looking for advice after getting their butts repeatedly handed to them by one of the game's sadistic bosses. Akos and Malos at the Olethro ruins, Patroka and Mikhail in the old factory, Aishma's core at Temperantia. Every boss battle from chapter 3 and onwards is pretty much a skill check. And unless you know what you're doing, you're gonna have a rough time. I cannot remember ever spending this much time learning about a single-player game outside the game. 
forum threads, Reddit posts, and YouTube videos basically taught me everything I know about how to fight in Xenoblade 2. And while I have to admit that there's an awesome community out there, with some super passionate content creators who do a great job of picking up the slack, it's really the game's job to teach you how to play. Showing your customer how to enjoy your product is such a fundamental part of product development. And that goes double for gaming, where the product is a non-essential luxury you can easily drop the second you're not having fun. Which kinda sucks, because the very same combat encounters that end up ruining casual players' fun can be some of the most rewarding fights in the game. And aside from knowing how to make the best use of your drivers and blades in combat, there's also a lot you can do to improve your odds in the game's menus. Xenoblade 2 did a lot to simplify the character customization process from the original game without removing too much of the complexity, and the changes are mostly for the better. Characters no longer have a bunch of armor slots to fill, and you don't have to worry about crafting all those gemstones. The result is less busy work, but it's really a double-edged sword. For someone who actually likes menu grinding, losing the armor slots kinda hurts. And the fact that you can no longer tweak your character's visual appearance is something I personally really miss. But Xenoblade 2 still offers a ton of customization options. And as frustrating as some of the fights can be if you come unprepared, there's a lot you can do to even the odds. You can switch out your blades for a different mix of roles, weapon types and elements. You can reconfigure your aux cores and accessories, try a different weapon, or shuffle your driver arts around. Or you could shop around for some extra special pouch items to give you that temporary boost you need to clear a tough fight. But the best part of the game's menus is the feature that ties it all together. The feature that lets you supercharge your blade's combat abilities and is literally designed to send you out into Xenoblade 2's vast world to engage with all of its side contents. The Blade Affinity Chart. Every blade has its own affinity chart, which is basically a list of tasks you can complete to make the blade stronger. Each node on the chart is unlocked by performing a specific action, such as using an ability, defeating a specific monster, or collecting a certain resource. The blade affinity chart encourages you to learn the game, explore widely, and try new things. They're essentially a giant to-do list for completing the game, and they can be extremely addictive. There's a lot you can do to improve your effectiveness in combat, and with the right combination of blades, accessories and aux cores, you can totally break the game. But that doesn't mean the design is without flaws. Xenoblade 2's driver arts are tied to weapon type and not character, and each weapon only gets four different arts. And while I appreciate the freedom for drivers to master any weapon I want, the small number of available arts, and the fact that each upgrade level is exponentially more expensive than the last means I never really felt like I had that much choice. I also found it frustrating that you have to refine aux cores through crafting before equipping them on your blades. You get a lot of unrefined aux cores as drops from monsters, but unless you spend some serious time hunting down materials, the moment you actually need a particular aux core to help you through a fight, you're probably gonna have to go out of your way to craft it. But my biggest beef with Xenoblade 2's party customization is actually one of the game's most central features. Because the game's defining mechanic, the one that's designed to offer the most freedom, can also feel the most restrictive. One of my issues with the original Xenoblade was feeling locked into the character's predefined roles as a casual player. Xenoblade 2 technically solves this problem through the blade system, but in practice it's far from a perfect solution. In the blade system, drivers take on the roles of the blades they equip, and any mix of roles is more or less viable, even if you'll have to work a lot harder to pull off the weird combinations. Almost anything is possible if you master the game, and once you fully understand the system, you probably won't even need a tank or healer to do well in combat. But mixing roles on the same driver can be hard to get right, especially when we're talking about your AI-controlled allies. 
giving Nia an attacker blade might seem like a great way to mix in a bit of extra damage. But since there's no way to prevent your allies from switching blades in battle, chances are she'll go on the offense the moment you need her healing the most. And since every driver has a personal blade they cannot normally remove, it's a lot easier to just go along with their default roles. There are definitely ways to work around these issues, but I often found it hard to form the exact party I wanted. And when you think about how much potential the blade system has, seeing it stifled by a bunch of restrictions is kind of a shame. And we haven't even talked about the most frustrating part. While some incredibly powerful blades automatically join the party at different points of the game, relying entirely on the story to fill up your roster will leave you starved for choice. To expand your options, you have to bond more blades. Xenoblade 2 includes a gacha mechanic, where you can spend core crystals of different rarities to recruit random new blades. You get these crystals by killing monsters, and most of the time using them will result in the creation of a so-called common blade with a generic appearance and standard abilities. But if you're lucky, you'll pull a rare blade, a unique character with its own set of talents, a distinct personality, and a story to tell. It usually takes a lot of core crystals to get anything good, but it's not a predatory system since outside of the one-time purchase of the game's very reasonably priced DLC, there's no way to spend real-time money to increase your chances. Blade bonding is essentially a single-player offline gacha mechanic that ties directly into the game's world building. It's an interesting idea, but I personally find it mostly annoying. The process is obviously random, so you'll have to spam a ton of core crystals to get anything specific. Since you have to decide who will bond a blade before you know what you'll get, it's really easy to end up with a bunch of sad blades bonded to the wrong driver. And fixing mistakes can be harder than you think, since the game is super restrictive about letting you trade blades between drivers. I get that the bond between driver and blade is the whole point of the story, and it makes sense that you cannot swap blades back and forth like a piece of equipment. But the way it plays out in practice means your options for party customization are often limited. Blade bonding was designed to add an element of chance that makes each playthrough slightly different. The system does best when you work with what you get instead of worrying so much about what you want. And the game's rare blades give you something to gun for in the endgame. A reason to farm super bosses for legendary core crystals, level up your characters, fill out your blades affinity charts, find the best core chips, accessories and aux cores, and learn the ins and outs of fusion combos, chain attacks and full bursts. But for the most part, blade bonding feels like a tedious distraction that gets in the way of enjoying the game. And the system honestly isn't even a great fit for Xenoblade 2's story. While it might seem like the gacha mechanic helps illustrate an important element of the game's world building, it actually really doesn't. The very concept of core crystals is that each one holds a unique individual blade, ready to resonate with a new driver. Blades aren't random, but rather a combination of the core crystal's unique programming and the nature of the first driver to resonate with it. And as we'll get to later, that's the whole point of Xenoblade 2's story. And for a game that places such a heavy emphasis on a small number of mandatory blades you get through the story, it doesn't even make sense to introduce a whole big system where you customize your characters by recruiting random blades. When all is said and done, they could have ditched a random element and still given the player the exact same experience simply by replacing the blade bonding system with a dedicated recruitment quest for each blade. Doing side quests in Xenoblade 2 would have been so much more meaningful if you knew you'd get a unique core crystal at the end. Especially if this was the only way to get new blades outside of the main story. Xenoblade 2 already has a few blade recruitment quests that work just like that, and I wish they'd gone all in on that pattern instead of trying to force a square peg into a round hole with a gacha mechanic. But as tedious as the blade gacha can get, collecting waifus and developing their affinity charts at least has some synergy with the game's other mechanics. 
And that's important, because Xenoblade 2 works best when the game gives you plenty of reason to go exploring its world. The Xenoblade series approaches its level design from an open world perspective, and while these games are a far cry from something like Skyrim, Grand Theft Auto or Ghost of Tsushima, they do take a lot of inspiration from that style of game. There are vast open areas to explore, fast travel points to unlock and plenty of secrets to find. But Xenoblade 2 is still a very linear experience. While most open world games do have a step-by-step -step path you have to follow to finish the story, the world itself is a single seamless sandbox for you to explore. And though some sections of the map may be locked at the start of the game, you usually have a lot of freedom in picking where to go. What makes Xenoblade 2 different from true open world games is the fact that its world map is divided into separate zones that aren't interconnected. The areas are unlocked one by one as you progress through the story and the path between them is set in stone. Each individual area can be freely explored from the moment you get there, though certain parts of the map are more dangerous than others. Stepping off the critical path often leads you through regions dominated by high-level enemies, including unique named monsters that guard some serious loot. Some areas also contain obstacles or treasure troves that must be overcome using your blade's field skills. These are special talents like super strength, leaping and lockpicking that help you solve practical problems like opening a rusted shut gate or removing the toxic gas that blocks a tunnel. The upside of these gating mechanics is that previous areas of the game stay fresh throughout the story. It's impossible to see and do everything the first time around, so it pays to come back later with a stronger team and a more developed roster of blades. And while this isn't the seamless, interconnected world of a metroidvania, the backtracking playstyle is supported by the game's very generous fast travel system, which lets you zip back to any previously discovered landmark just as fast as the game can load the assets, which, to be fair, isn't super fast. The downside of exploring a world where the boundary between safe and dangerous is often razor thin is that there are many times when I'm minding my own business against level appropriate enemies when I'll suddenly get stomped by an overpowering super monster that just happened to wander too close. And locking the best discoveries behind field skill requirements is a cool idea in theory but it comes with a lot of problems. It's meant to play into the random element of the blade bonding system, since the treasure you find along the way will depend on what blades you have and how much time you've spent developing them. But in practice, it takes a lot of the fun out of exploring Xenoblade 2's world, since anytime you find something cool, it's usually locked behind skills you don't have. There's even a couple of points in the game where you have to pass a field skill check to progress through the story. And if you haven't been doing a whole lot of optional content so far, getting those skills is gonna set you back a couple of hours each time. Xenoblade 2 also has a problem with verticality. Many of the game's areas are explored in three dimensions, but the minimap doesn't do well with heights, and pathfinding can sometimes be a huge pain. The level design often feels misleading, and some locations can be an absolute nightmare to find, like the Dawn View Grotto in Gormat, the way to the old factory in Mor Ardain, and the icy path from the city of Teosuar to the snow-covered fields at the bottom of the Tantal region. Exploring in three dimensions can also be a big problem in combat. You spend a lot of time doing battle on and around cliffs, bridges and narrow ledges, and I've lost count of the number of times I fell to my death while fighting a monster or lost a healing potion to a pit, or saw an ally literally drop out of the fight by walking off a ledge, or having the monster itself plummet to its death to rob me of my rewards. The game's camera can also be very unhelpful, especially in tight spaces. It's all well and good while you're running around a wide open field, but the moment you press up against a wall or enter one of the game's many cramped rooms and narrow tunnels, it's almost impossible to find a camera height that actually works. But these are issues that can be overlooked, and there's still a lot of stuff to see and do in Xenoblade 2's vast world. The real problem is something much more fundamental, 
open world games are really all about the joy of exploration, and Xenoblade 2 just doesn't give me that feeling. Xenoblade 2 is a massive open world adventure, and it's hard not to appreciate the sheer volume of content the game offers. There's an enormous number of locations to explore, hidden areas to track down, treasure to loot, and challenges to take on. And it's honestly hard to find it all. There's a huge low ground area in Temperantia that's only available if you come back after beating the boss, and I never even knew it existed on my first playthrough. And even after two playthroughs, I still somehow missed all of Cooley Lake in Gormoth, those Leftharian islands that move from place to place, and the container delivery system you can hitch a ride on in Morardain. There's so much stuff to discover if you're willing to go out of your way. But that's just a thing. Xenoblade 2's world design doesn't really make me want to explore. As large as the areas are, and as much as there is to find, I never really felt rewarded for simply exploring. The world feels incredibly restrictive. It's full of barriers and obstacles, slopes that look like you should be able to climb them even though you cannot, and lots of dead ends. Open world design should be all about branching paths and alternate routes to give you that feeling of freedom. But in Xenoblade 2, it often seems like there's only one way to get to where you want to go, giving the vast open landscapes a linear feel. And the moment you find something interesting, it's usually blocked behind a field skill check you cannot yet pass. Of course, exploration isn't just about the tangible rewards, but also about the intangible, like immersing yourself in a fantastical environment. And Xenoblade 2's world has plenty of beautiful sights, emerging from the gloomy tunnels in the underbelly of Gormat and looking out across the sun-kissed vastness of the Garanti Plain, watching day turn to night as the bright lights of Toregoth beckon in the distance. The snow-capped ruins of Tantal, the misty expanse of the Eleftherian archipelago, and the radiant colors of Uriah's stomach. But not all of the game's environments are just as inspired, and the overall presentation feels like a step in the wrong direction. Xenoblade 2's areas feel just a bit less unique than the ones from the first game. Compared to Sword Valley, Frontier Village, and the Fallen Arm, none of the game's environments feel all that inventive. And as pretty as Xenoblade 2 can look in its best moments, it still lacks the breathtaking vistas from Xenoblade 1. Maybe I'm biased, but I never saw anything that compares to the rainbow glows of Satoral Marsh or the flowing gemstone sky of Erit Sea at night. Xenoblade 2's world design is very ambitious, but some of the ideas feel undercooked. Anytime you need to find a certain item or monster to refine an aux core, complete a side quest, or unlock an affinity node, you're pretty much on your own. An in-game mechanic that gave just the right amount of guidance in hunting down certain items and specific monsters could have turned a tedious task into an integral part of the gameplay, because figuring things out on your own is a lot more fun than googling the answer. I also think salvaging could have been handled a lot better. The idea of scattering salvaging spots around the world where Rex can use his unique skills to haul up precious loot from the bottom of the Cloud Sea is a really cool concept, but salvaging is seriously underused. It's completely absent from one of the game's major areas, Uriah, which is doubly bad since you'll be spending a lot of time there right around the most formative part of your experience with the game. By the time you leave Uriah, chances are you've forgotten salvaging even exists. I also think the game should have given you the cylinders you need to salvage as regular rewards from treasure chests and monsters, instead of forcing you to buy them from special shops. This would have made salvaging into a natural part of the core gameplay loop. Find a salvaging spot, spend a couple of cylinders you've picked up along the way, and move on. There's also the whole concept of Cloud Sea Tides that draws from the game's unique world building. A system where different parts of the world become accessible or inaccessible as the Cloud Sea rises and falls is such a compelling idea. But the way it's implemented feels entirely pointless. There's only like two areas in the whole game where the tides even matter, and you might not remember the mechanic even exists. 
it feels like the skeleton of a cool idea that was never fleshed out. Having to plan your route according to the Cloud Sea Tides could have been an incredible feat of immersive world building. And that's a real shame. Because for all the flaws of Xenoblade's exploration, the world you explore is actually really cool. The story of Xenoblade 2 takes place in the world of Allrest, an endless ocean topped with thick clouds, where the only available land is on the back of colossal creatures called Titans that swim through the Cloud Sea. The world of Allrest is home to humans, but also to artificial life forms known as Blades. Blades are born from core crystals, and the person who awakens them becomes their driver, forming a lifelong bond between the two. Blades bestow great powers onto their drivers, and allow them to wield a special weapon formed from the Blade's core crystal. Xenoblade 2 tells the story of Rex, a young salvager who becomes the driver of Pyra, a legendary blade called the Aegis, and their quest to reach the World Tree and seek the mythical land of Elysium. Along the way, Rex and Pyra cross swords with others who seek to use the power of the Aegis, form an unshakable bond with each other, and uncover long-hidden secrets about the true nature of their world. The concept of a world where people live upon the bodies of colossal creatures was already there in the first game, but Xenoblade 2 does a much better job of bringing the idea to life. The consequences of living on the backs of giant creatures are explored in detail, and the conflicts that arise from the scarcity of land and resources are a big part of the story like the war between Mor Ardain and Uriah for control of the Titan Gormat, or the suffering of the Tantalese people who are forced to drain the lifeblood of the Titan Genbu to afford their country's annual tribute. The world of Allrest feels a lot more present in both story and gameplay. The Cloud Sea surrounds you wherever you go. In Gormat, you can look at the horizon and see the Titan's horn waving in the distance. The trading hub of Goldmouth hangs like cargo beneath the Argentum Trade Guild's Titan, making an island where merchant ships can dock. And Uriah swims through the clouds, emerging like a leviathan to swallow traders and mercenaries whole, and the people make their home inside its guts. Xenoblade 2 is more committed to its world building than most JRPGs, but it still doesn't go quite as far as I'd like. Some of the concepts the game introduces aren't given enough space. It's great that Rex keeps reminding us he's a salvager, but I would have liked to see these skills play a bigger role in the story past the first chapter. It would have been a lot more interesting if Rex had to put together a proper expedition to find the land of Moritha, instead of just ending up there after falling off a cliff. Rex's opening narration that sets up the Cloud Sea, the World Tree, the Titans, and the Architect would have felt a lot more natural if it had been delivered in the form of a favorite bedtime story told by his gramps. And instead of just watching a random titan sink beneath the cloud sea, the issue of land becoming more scarce would have had a lot more power if we had started the game with Rex on a salvaging expedition. Maybe he and his crewmates have to retrieve their salvage before a dying titan sinks below the cloud sea. A sequence like that could have introduced the Salvagers Code, established Rex's skill and the camaraderie between Salvagers by having Rex save one of his crewmates when something goes wrong, and illustrated the lengths people would go to to salvage resources from the past. And by showing us the abandoned houses and the last stubborn holdouts being evacuated from the dying titan, the terrible danger facing the world would have been so much more keenly felt. I also think it's a shame we didn't get more travel sequences on the ships that take you between titans. You spend so much time fast traveling in this game, it kind of undermines the scope of the Cloud Sea. Traveling the Cloud Sea is such a unique concept, and I think the game could have done a lot more to convey the feeling of riding a ship through impenetrable mist as colossal monsters swim unseen beside you, and the ruins of entire civilizations spread out beneath your feet. The trip on the Salvager ship in Chapter 1 is one of my favorite parts of the game, and I would have loved to see more sequences like it. But as important as the Cloud Sea and the Titans are, the most important part of Xenoblade 2's world building is actually more about the characters. Or rather, some of the characters. 
Xenoblade 2's central theme is the bond between drivers and blades, and the story explores this central concept in great detail. Blades are born when a driver resonates with a core crystal, and remain bonded to their driver for as long as they both shall live. The stronger the bond between them, a concept called affinity or trust, the better the driver-blade duo will perform. A source of much of the conflict at the heart of the story is the fact that blades are immortal but live multiple lives. Blades do not age or suffer disease, but will return to their core crystal if they sustain critical injuries or if their driver dies. A blade that returns to its core crystal can be reawakened by another driver at a later time, but returns without any memory of its past life. The idea of the driver-blade bond is simple, but incredibly dynamic, and the game explores this idea from many different angles. The character of Tora is an exploration of what happens when a person born without the inborn ability to become a driver has enough determination to break the rules. Tora and his artificial blade Poppy are often played for comic relief, but the interaction between them is genuinely fascinating. Conversely, even monsters can resonate with core crystals, and a beast like Wolfric helps make an important point, that a new blade mirrors the nature of its original driver. Wolfric was awakened by a monster, so he looks and acts like a beast, but when he's awakened a second time as the blade of a human, he gains a gentler side and begins a long and arduous process to overcome his brutish origins. The concept of blades living multiple lives is also explored at great length. Bridget keeps a diary of her different incarnations to remind herself of who she's been, but she's filled with constant doubt as to whether she can trust what's written inside. Praxis struggles to come to terms with the crimes of her past self, trying to reconcile the person she is now with the person people tell her she used to be. And Jin's obsessive need to keep his fallen driver's memory alive is what led to his destruction. The story isn't afraid to explore some of the more questionable consequences of the core crystal concept. Bridget and Aegean are considered imperial treasures of Morardain, passed down as family heirlooms and awakened to guard each generation of the royal family. Blades whose drivers fall in battle may end up serving the person who killed them and bandits sometimes target drivers to steal their blades. And when Laura accidentally resonated with Jin's core crystal, her stepfather was ready to kill her to have it back. The driver-blade bond might seem like a simple master-servant relationship at first glance, but it's much more complicated than that. Blades are born with a powerful instinct to serve and protect, but they're not slaves to their drivers. Morag sends Bridget to Gormoth alone, showing that blades can act on their own. Malos and Minoth both went rogue and eventually refused to follow Amalthus' orders. And Theory chose to take her own driver's life to protect her sister. The story doesn't pound these ideas into your skull with big info dumps either. The facts about the driver-blade bond are introduced organically. You learn about the bond and what it means to be a driver through Rex's interactions with Malos and Nia and you get to see firsthand how they work as you fight your way through the ancient ship. The scene where a desperate young man from Torgoth risks his life to become a driver to provide for his siblings is a serious example of immersive world building. And many of the more interesting aspects of the driver blade bond come from optional side quests that explore these ideas. And as great a job as the game does in exploring the different aspects of the driver blade bond, there are still so many left to touch upon. What about the feelings of an ever youthful blade caring for an aging driver? Or a driver who takes their own life to punish a wayward blade for stepping out on her? Or a driver who's held hostage to force his blade to serve another master? The possibilities are pretty much endless, and the real takeaway is just how easy it is to think about more. I could go on forever just brainstorming ideas on the driver blade bond, and that's a sign of great world building. Xenoblade 2 has many fascinating blades with interesting stories of their own, but the most fascinating story of them all is the story of the game's most important character, or maybe I should say characters. Pyra's story begins a long time before the events of the game, and it gets pretty confusing. She is an Aegis, 
one of two immensely powerful blades who were set to watch over the world by its creator, the architect. The cores of the two Aegises were taken from Elysium 500 years ago by the story's villain, Amalthus, who resonated with one of them to awaken Malice. Malice, poisoned by Amalthus's hatred, embarked on a quest to destroy the world. Unable to control him, Amalthus gave the other core to the legendary hero, Adam, who resonated with it to awaken Mithra. Adam and Mithra fought Malice, but in the deciding battle, Adam lost control of Mithra's power, and the fallout caused the destruction of the land of Torna. Racked with guilt, Mithra constructed a secondary personality, Pyra, and went to sleep wishing for oblivion, leaving Pyra to bear the burden of her past. Rex first meets Pyra and becomes her driver after she saves his life by sharing her core crystal with him. But we're later introduced to Mithra when the Aegis's original personality manifests to protect Rex during the battle at the Olethro ruins. Pyra and Mithra are two personalities in one body, and the way the game portrays them is very interesting. Both girls are extremely charming and likable, but in very different ways. Mithra acts tough, but she's really a big softy. She'll force a switch when Rex is in trouble, then tell him off for being a fool. And she gets emotional when Tora is reunited with his father in the old factory, but she'd never admit it out loud. Pyra is gentle and caring and might seem like the perfect guardian angel, but she's also deeply tormented. She's outwardly cheerful and upbeat, but she hides a deep trauma behind her smile. People often argue about which of the two Aegis girls is the best character, but that's really a mistake, because the story of Pyra and Mithra gets a lot more interesting when you realize they aren't two different people in one body. They're really two aspects of the same person. When Mithra shows up to yell at Rex, it's because Pyra isn't able to express her anger. And when Mithra retreats to let Pyra handle something embarrassing or sad, it's not because Mithra doesn't care. She couldn't deal with those emotions, so she made a new part of herself that could. Pyra is gentle and Mithra is confrontational. The Aegis has two masks that she puts on, depending on the need that arises. And that's something that many of us should be able to sympathize with. But Pyra and Mithra have one very important thing in common. They both begin the story desperately wanting to die. The story of Pyra and Mithra is a clever examination of the Driver Blade Bond. Because for all of her power and immortality, the Aegis lacks something that other blades have. The opportunity to forget the past. In Pyra's own words, a blade can live forever. Eternity is a long time to collect bad memories. Sometimes being able to forget is a blessing. Pyra spent the last 500 years wallowing in self-loathing over her past mistakes, and her journey to Elysium is secretly a journey of self-annihilation. She goes to Elysium to ask her father, the architect, for permission to die. In essence, Pyra is afraid to live because she cannot bear to remember her past. But Pyra's journey with Rex and the bond of trust that grows between them changes her. And as Pyra comes to terms with her role in the world and the actions of her past, she realizes she no longer wants to die. Pyra's story is a masterclass in characterization. It's told through subtle gestures and clever innuendo. It's hidden beneath the game's glitzy surface, and it's only when we finally get the point that we can look back and see the signs that were there all along. The only criticism I have to give is that it could have been less subtle. The few scenes we get where Pyra and Mithra interact with each other is some of the best content in the whole game. Seeing them talk to each other, bargain with each other, and make decisions together is absolutely fascinating, and I really would have liked to see a lot more of this. Nevertheless, Pyra is a great character, and one of the highlights of Xenoblade 2. And in a game full of spectacular scenes, Pyra just might be the biggest star because she takes the spotlight in what is, to me, the best scene in the whole game. Xenoblade 2 is a dramatic game, and the story has plenty of moments that blew me away. The first meeting with Pyra 
in the dream of Elysium, Rex and Pyra's first battle as driver and blade, Mithra's first appearance and Vandham's death, Nia's heartfelt reveal in Spirit Crucible Elpis, and Pyra and Mithra awakening Numa and becoming the Master Blade. But the game's best scene, by far, is Pyra's ultimatum. Pyra's love and commitment come into full force in the battle at Genbu Crown. Outmatched and facing defeat in their fight against Jin and Malus, Pyra makes a desperate bargain. Knowing that Malus needs her alive to realize his plans, Pyra threatens to annihilate herself on the spot if Jin doesn't spare Rex and the others. This is the scene that really sold me on Pyra. It's shocking, dramatic, and emotional. And it shows the true depths of Pyra's conviction. With her back firmly against the wall, Pyra is ready to gamble it all for a chance to save the people she loves. It's a fantastic moment of pure suspense, a sensational cliffhanger to kick off the story's third and final act, and an amazing setup for a romantic payoff. And here at last I have to mention the music. Xenoblade 2's soundtrack is a collaboration between several very gifted composers, who all make great contributions to the overall product. But many of the game's most important story beats are raised into majesty by the compositions of the legendary Yasunori Mitsuda. And Pyra's Ultimatum is no exception. The track that forms the backdrop to this scene is called The Decision, and it's an absolutely stunning orchestral piece that conveys an all-encompassing atmosphere of tension, dread, and desperate hope. While there are many great composers of video game music whose work I admire, Mitsuda will always be my number one. He's not the most prolific composer out there, and there are others whose bodies of work have meant more to gaming as a whole. But when Mitsuda shows up, the heavens divide. He's a level 99 divine sound assassin who appears out of nowhere to attack your weak spot for crippling damage. You'll heal, but you'll never be the same. Unfortunately, as great a scene as Pyrus Ultimatum is, it's wasted on the game's protagonist, Rex. And the hero's reaction to Pyrus' abduction is probably the weakest point in the whole story. When the woman he's sworn to defend is taken by the enemy, Rex's response is to give up. It's realistic, I guess, but it's about the worst move you could make if you're writing a romance. When the hero should be moving heaven and earth to get Pyra back, he throws in the towel. This should have been Rex's defining moment, the moment when he becomes a true hero and a man worthy of Pyra's love. He should have been out the door the moment he woke up, willing to do everything in his power, even if it feels hopeless. Sure, Rex eventually found his feet, but only after getting some sand slapped into him by Nia and Bridget. Imagine finding out later that your man had to be talked into coming after you. But Rex's reaction is really a symptom of a deeper problem. Pyra's sacrifice at Genbu Crown is the best scene in the game, but it could have been a hundred times stronger if the game actually had a functioning love story. Because as cute as Rex and Pyra can look together in cutscenes, their romance is actually totally broken. Rex is a great guy, but I just don't see him with Pyra. To put it bluntly, he's way too young for her. The hero is 15 years old, but everything about him is so childlike. Even the way he swings his weapon in battle makes him look like a little kid playing around with his father's sword. And every time I see Rex and Pyra together, all I can think is, she looks like his mom. But age is just a number, especially in a JRPG and I could keep my cringe muscle under control if the rest of the romance was any good. But the real issues run much deeper. The relationship between Rex and Pyra feels forced, and there is very little in the way of genuine bonding between them. Rex consistently fails to interact with Pyra in a meaningful way, which kind of makes sense since he's basically just a clueless kid. He really has very little to bring to the table when it comes to emotional intelligence, 
and while I can totally see how Pyra would admire his kindness and draw strength from his relentless support, outside of like the campfire scene at the start of the game, he never actually does anything that feels remotely romantic. And considering that Pyra spent the last 500 years obsessing over the past, it's more than a little gratuitous that she falls so hard and fast for Rex, when she should really be stuck on her original driver, Adam. Instead of building a believable relationship between hero and heroine, the story leans on anime tropes to turn up the heat. The scene where Mithra goes sleepwalking and wakes up in Rex's bed is the perfect example. I'd be totally on board with all kinds of sexy shenanigans if it fit in a story, but this scene has zero setup and comes out of nowhere. It's pure fan service, and it's weirdly undermined by the story of Torna the Golden Country, where we find out this is just something Mitra does and has nothing to do with attraction. Even one of the story's central themes ends up working against the romance. Rex's defining feature is his unwavering trust, and it's this quality that makes him the perfect person to save the world. But it also means he never questions Pyra, even when he should. I get that Rex would have a lot of faith in Pyra, especially after she saved his life. She's gorgeous and kind and protective, and Gramps seems to trust her as well. But he really should have pushed for some answers when it became obvious that Pyra was holding things back that could have gotten him killed, like the fact that Malice and Jin are blades, or that Amalthus is Malice's driver. I'm not saying Rex should have forced Pyra to spill the beans, but the relationship between them would have been a lot more interesting if he'd been a bit more assertive. Imagine a scene where he takes Pyra aside and tells her, if there's something you're holding back, I understand if you're not ready to tell me, that's fine, but if there are things I need to know to keep you safe, to keep all of us safe, then I'm trusting you to tell me, alright? A scene like that would have had so much power. Imagine how Pyra must feel, torn between the wounds of her past and the burden of keeping secrets from the person she loves. Imagine a scene where Rex and Pyra argue, and Rex maybe pushes too far. Then later he apologizes in a super heartfelt way. Scenes of Rex being gentle and attentive to Pyra's feelings. Tender scenes where he shows her he cares and that he's there for her. That he's willing to go through a lot to support her. And imagine the scene where Pyra actually finally tells Rex the whole story. In her own words, laying bare her mangled heart. How in the world is that scene not already in the game? Scenes like these would have made the romance work, and it would have been one of the best love stories in JRPG history. But none of these ideas would make sense in Xenoblade 2, because Rex isn't the right man for that kind of romance, and it's not where the story is going. As I will show later, Rex's unwillingness to question Pyra works perfectly in the service of the game's central theme but it's a horrible way to write a love story. Even though the game's central romance falls completely flat in my eyes, Xenoblade 2 is still an enjoyable story with great characters, amazing world building, plenty of exciting set pieces, and some really cool plot twists. But in spite of all of this, the question that's been on my mind ever since I first beat the game is this. Why do I find the game's story so forgettable? Outside of a few key moments that really stuck with me, like Vandam's death, the true nature of Pyra and Mithra, and a big reveal about Elysium and the Architect, almost every detail about Xenoblade 2's story was wiped from my mind within a month of first beating the game. I could remember the broad strokes, but not the way they fit together. Why was Pyra trying to reach Elysium? What was Amalthus trying to do? Why was Rex able to open the seal on Spirit Crucible Elpis? Why did the heroes go to Tantal? Who was Laura, and was she the same person as Hayes? What was Malus so angry about? Why was Jen working with him? And what was that Xenogears looking mech he was piloting at the end? These were all actual questions I wrote down before starting my second playthrough. After playing the game twice, and spending way too much time thinking about it, I can kinda see why, because Xenoblade 2's story can be pretty confusing. Many of the game's most important plot points take place in the distant past. Amalthus's fateful decision after failing to find the Architect, Mithra's reaction to the destruction of Torna, the origin of Malice's hatred, and Laura's death that broke Jen's heart. It's a story that began long before most of the heroes were born, 
and the game can be incredibly cagey about handing out the information you need to understand people's motivations. Instead of telling you things outright, the game prefers to imply them, often in the form of separate clues you have to put together on your own. The motivations of the key characters can be very hard to follow, and even super basic questions like what are the villains actually planning to do is something you have to figure out on your own. The story also relies heavily on withholding information from the protagonist. Many plot points hinge on Pyra, Gramps and others not telling Rex anything until they absolutely have to. And it doesn't help that Rex almost never asks questions. This method of preserving mystery through don't ask, don't tell is one of the laziest storytelling devices I can think of. And it robs the heroes of all their agency. Watching the characters work through their problems and come up with clever solutions is such a fun part of any kind of story. But it's kind of hard to be proactive or make plans when you don't have the facts. As a result, the story often lacks forward momentum. And despite some really dramatic highlights, there's very little urgency and tension in the overall plot. The bad guys are hunting for Pyra, but the heroes put zero effort into figuring out how to defeat them. They're searching for Elysium, but it doesn't seem to matter if they get there sooner or later, and they end up taking a lot of detours that only turn out to be meaningful by sheer coincidence. The heroes head to Endol with Cole's dagger without even knowing who they're supposed to present it to. Things only work out because Fan Lenorn somehow finds them in the old factory and brings them to see Amalthus. And they're only in the old factory to begin with because they chase down the artificial blade Lila, and then the bad guys just happen to be involved anyway. There's just very little cause and effect in the story, and the heroes spend most of the game just drifting with the wind, following whatever advice NPCs give them. It reads more like the writers worked backwards to plot out the necessary steps to place people where they need to be. A series of convenient excuses to show off some really cool set pieces, provide necessary plot points and build to the big reveals. It's only at the end of chapter 6 when Pyra gets taken that the game really kicks into gear, and that's pretty darn late to start raising the stakes. Some of the game's most critical plot points are also surprisingly sloppy. The worst of these is probably when Malice rips the data from Pyra's core crystal at the Cliffs of Moritha. We're clearly told this act will leave Pyra dead or an empty husk once it's done. But even though Rex shows up too late to stop it, Pyra's just fine. Apparently, the destruction of her core crystal was no big deal after all. It's a super cool scene, but this is one of the few times in the game when there's any kind of stakes. I would have swallowed even the cheesiest, hand waviest of explanations, but to get nothing at all after the game built all that suspense for this plot point just makes me feel cheated. But at the same time, the way this scene plays out is a perfect fit for this story. Low stakes and fake deaths are part of Xenoblade 2's vibe, because compared to other Xeno titles, this game has a very different tone. In some ways, Xenoblade 2 feels like the least Xeno of all Xeno games. And a lot of my issues with this game come down to a deliberate difference in tone. It's pretty obvious that Xenoblade 2 was intentionally designed to appeal to a younger audience than the previous games in the Xeno franchise. And as much as I love the original Xeno Gears and the Xeno Saga trilogy, I'll be the first to admit they're not exactly beginner friendly. The first Xenoblade Chronicles was itself a major departure from the style of storytelling seen in the earlier titles. But even compared to that, this game clearly has a different vibe. One of the things I most associate with the Xeno series is complex characters. Introspective protagonists with rich inner lives who are filled with doubts and fears and are working through their own traumas. Xenoblade 2's Rex is not a bad protagonist, but he's just a lot more straightforward than I'd expect from a Xeno game hero. Rex has no internal landscape. He's killed and brought back to life near the start of the game, but never gives it another thought. He becomes the master driver, but never stops to reflect on what that means or how he feels about it. And except for a moment of weakness around the middle, Rex powers through the whole story without hesitation, almost never questioning his actions, ideals or chosen path. And as admirable as that may be, I find it kinda boring. Some of the game's other characters have a lot more to offer. 
Pyra, Jin, and Malice, and even Nia are all dealing with some pretty dark stuff from their past. But we don't get to see nearly enough of the story from their perspectives. Xenoblade 2 is also much more light-hearted than other Xeno titles. Love it or hate it, the game has a lot of comedy, even for a JRPG. And while there are some moments that really make me laugh, it doesn't always hit right. And even when bad stuff happens, the game never really lingers for long enough to make it hurt. The most heartbreaking stuff happens to NPCs or in the distant past, and even when the heroes suffer setbacks, there's rarely any real fallout. Rex gets stabbed through the chest by Jin, but Pyra just brings him back from the dead. Pyra has her core crystal sucked dry by Malice, but just walks it off. And the ending hand waves Pyra and Mithra back into existence without so much as a word of explanation. Van Ham's death kinda counts, I guess, but he's only with the party for a short while and no one really talks about him after he's gone. The game keeps making these painful promises, but then pulls every single punch it throws. The game also features a lot more fan service than ever before. This game has some of the thirstiest female character designs I've seen in a mainstream game, and that's saying a lot. And while these eye candy designs do not diminish the depth of the characters, it just feels a bit too gratuitous. There's no harm in showing some skin if that's who the character is, but Pyra is modest, a little awkward, and easily embarrassed, and there's nothing to suggest she's the kind of person who would choose to wear a pair of skin-tight hot pants that barely covers her butt. And I find it deeply ironic that Nia is one of the few female blades who doesn't wear revealing clothing, but only because she's hiding her true nature. When Nia resolves to live her life without shame, she strips down to an outfit that's barely more than a bikini. In the end, this is all a matter of personal preference. Xenoblade 2 isn't a bad game because it's lighter on the introspection and heavier on the comedy. But in many ways, Xenoblade 2 feels like a much more mainstream JRPG than any prior Xeno title. And while I could be dead wrong, I do get the feeling that Tetsuya Takahashi had to compromise on his creative vision in order to save his company. After failing to launch Xenogears as a franchise and wiping out with the Xenosaga series, the Xenoblade franchise might have been Takahashi's final shot to salvage something of his original vision. And if Xenoblade 2 was a desperate gamble, it paid off. Big time. And even though Xenoblade 2 can seem pretty shallow, there's still some classic Xeno goodness hiding at the bottom. Because even though it hits kind of different, at the core, it's still very much a Xeno game. To me, the qualities that define a Xeno title are compelling mysteries, expert foreshadowing, deep philosophical themes, and massive payoffs. Xeno games throw you into the middle of a complex, evolving narrative that's just as rich in backstory as in things to come. Typically, the story runs in two directions. There's the forward thrust of the plot, which is uncovered as you proceed through present events. But then there's also the probing of the past, where dialogue and flashbacks reveal the super important stuff that led up to the start of the game. It's these twin tracks of progression, seeing the characters grow and figure out their place in life, while also learning more about the events that came before that makes these games such incredible narrative experiences. And Xenoblade 2 definitely has that. From the moment we first meet Rex, the game weaves a web of mystery that draws you into the world and the complex story that's about to unfold. Who are these Torna guys, and why are they paying a king's ransom for Rex's services? What do they want to salvage from the ancient ship, and who is this strange girl sealed within its depths? The game has a lot of great secrets, and it reveals the big ones step by step. The true nature of blades, the revelation of flesh eaters and blade eaters, and the blades' relationship with the titans. These are critical concepts that lie at the heart of the story, and they're teased out slowly over the course of the game, with plenty of hints and captivating hooks along the way. Even the somewhat gratuitous scene at the Bats in Morardane takes the opportunity to drop an awesome bit of foreshadowing about Nia's true nature while we're admiring Mithra's half-naked body. Xenoblade 2 uses many familiar Xeno-style storytelling devices, like heavy use of dramatic irony and an emphasis on cryptic cutscenes from the villain's perspective. 
Sure, the game can be too reluctant to spell things out, but that's why these questions are so compelling. The transition from Chapter 4 to Chapter 5 is the perfect example. Here, we first meet Fanla Norn, then get a series of flashbacks that establish the characters of Laura and Hayes, while giving us a glimpse of Adam, Mithra, Bridget, and Jin from 500 years ago. Scenes like these are what Xeno games are all about. Scenes that expand the story in disorienting ways, suggest hidden connections you hadn't seen before, and leave you desperate to know more. The story builds mystery with subtlety and power, and without beating you over the head with the facts. Some of the game's best moments are things you only really appreciate on a second playthrough. When Jin murders Fan Lenorn at Temperantia, it seems senseless and brutal, but only because we don't see the big picture. Fan is a Maltese's blade, but in her past life, she and Jin were both bonded to Laura. When Jin confronts the heroes at Temperantia, he sees his old friend, a slave to the man they both hated, brainwashed to remove all traces of Haze, the person she used to be, her core crystal broken in half to empower her tormentor. Jin did what he did out of compassion. He didn't murder Fan. He released Haze from captivity. Even though the story takes it too far sometimes, there's still a beauty in putting two and two together on your own. The conversation between Malos and the Architect near the end of the game is a masterclass example of using subtext in writing dialogue. Here's a scene where you have to apply your own understanding of the story to truly get what passes between them. Malos does get his answer, but the true meaning is in the words that are left unsaid, and the scene is that much stronger for it. Xenoblade 2's story demands a lot from the player, both in time and engagement. It's often confusing and leaves a lot unspoken. But the rewards are there, and the payoffs are potentially huge. The first appearance of Mithra, the realization that the Torna gang are all blades, and the meeting with the architect are powerful moments that make the long journey and all that build up feel more than worth it. And at the end of the day, Xenoblade 2 has perhaps the most Xeno scene in Xeno history. Xenoblade 2's final chapter opens with a spectacular scene that blows the story wide open. In a flashback from a past unimaginably distant, we get to see the events that led to the creation of Xenoblade 2's world and the inciting incident of the entire Xenoblade franchise. It's an unbelievably awesome scene that sends shivers through my body every time I see it. It's the kind of massive payoff that makes 60 plus hours of gameplay feel like a small price to pay for two minutes of breathtaking wonder. It's the kind of cosmic sci-fi mysticism that I loved about Xenogears and Xenosaga, and it's my favorite part of the Xenoblade series. Xenoblade 2's story is at its best when you're willing to put in the work. Because even when it comes to some of the game's most central questions, the answers don't come for free. You have to earn them yourself. And I cannot think of a better example than the most baffling question of them all. What was Jin actually trying to do, and why? Jin spends most of the story serving as the primary antagonist. And it's only towards the end of the game that we learn his true motivations to help Malus realize his long-held desire of reaching Elysium, demanding the answers he's been denied from the Architect and possibly destroying the world. Jin's motivations come from his tragic past. He is a flesh eater, a special kind of blade whose body has been fused with humanoid cells, granting him tremendous power as well as the ability to survive his own driver's death. But what makes Jin unique is the way he became a flesh eater. As his beloved driver, Laura, lay dying from a horrible wound, she confessed she could not bear the thought of Jin forgetting her upon his return to his core crystal. Desperate to keep Laura's memory alive in any way he could, Jin used a forbidden technique to consume Laura's heart, making him effectively immortal. But here's where the story gets hazy. We know that Jin was heartbroken by losing Laura and that he hates Amalthus for ordering the attack that caused her death. 
We know he hates the architect and sees the driver blade bond as a form of slavery. And we know Jin seeks Pyra's power to restore Malice's damaged core crystal and open the way to Elysium so that Malice can kill the architect and destroy the world. But there's still a long way to go from being Laura's blade to wanting to wipe out all of humanity. Jin's transformation seems almost absurd. How could he join forces with Malice, the very calamity that Laura devoted her life to fighting? How could he believe the driver blade bond is fundamentally broken when he had a true loving partnership with a genuinely amazing person who treated blade and human alike with the utmost respect? Laura was a protector, a kind soul who wanted to make the world a better place. Jin kept his driver's memory alive, but he turned his back on everything she believed in. Even after two playthroughs and armed with the insights from Torna the Golden Country, I still couldn't understand Jin's motivations. So I looked for answers online. I've read plenty of great theories about what drove Jin to ally with Malice and seek the destruction of humankind. And many of them are clever and insightful. But what they all have in common is this. They're all just theories. Because these questions are never conclusively answered in the game. Jin's actions can seem inconsistent and bizarre. But maybe that's the whole point. Maybe Jin's motivations are senseless because he's a broken man searching for meaning in a world that's moved on without him. He's not your typical villain with unshakable convictions and a master plan. He doesn't know what he's doing or what will come of it. Only that he has to do something. He's utterly lost and his actions are driven by sheer want of a cause. A cause he found in the unlikeliest of companions. After losing Laura, the one person in the world Jin could actually connect with was the very man who had sought to destroy everything Jin once held dear. The equally broken Malice. Two blind men showing each other the way. In the end, it's just a theory. But that's what Xenoblade 2 is all about. Finding your own answers. Leaving a question unanswered can be a powerful thing. And for many players, Jin's story obviously resonates with them. He's easily one of the most popular characters from the Xenoblade franchise. And while I would have liked to see more of his perspective and understand his thoughts, I can totally see why. Much like the question of Jin's motivations, there's value to be found in Xenoblade 2's story, if you care to look. We each get to take something of our own away from the game. And that brings me to Xenoblade 2's central theme. But first, we have to talk about my favorite character. Xenoblade 2 is a great adventure full of mystery, spectacle and stunning revelations. But the best part of the story is without a doubt the characters. Sure, the characters all draw from familiar archetypes, but there's so much more than just their tropes. Each member of the main cast is incredibly well realized and has enough depth and personality to make them feel like unique individuals. The dialogue is strong, the voice acting is generally great, and the English translation adds a ton of color to the character's speech. I love Pyra for her kindness, self-effacing charm and hidden depths of feeling. Mithra for her bossy attitude, firecracker temper and unexpected soft side. Zeke and Pandoria for being the cutest couple and always making me laugh. Poppy for her enthusiasm, honesty and natural talent for throwing shade. And Morag for being the best big sister anyone could have. Before my second time through the game, I would have said my favorite character was easily Nia. She's an irreverent, cocky, hot-headed badass with a heart of purest gold. She's got great chemistry with her Blade Dromark, a heartbreaking backstory, and a solid character arc that's all about learning to love yourself. It's a powerful story that should resonate with a lot of people who have to pretend to be something they're not just to keep their place in society. Which is pretty darn cool. While I still love Nia and stand by everything I just said, after two playthroughs and sitting down to really think about the meaning of the story, I have a new favorite character, and it's probably an unlikely candidate. They're not my favorite because they're admirable or likable. 
Rather, I'm drawn to this character by an entirely different feeling, compassion. Because even in a game that's jam-packed with sad backstories, this character is by far the most broken, pitiful being in all of Xenoblade 2. Like Pyra, Malice is an Aegis awakened from one of the cores of the Trinity Processor. He's a genocidal master blade who hates humanity and spends the entire story searching for a way to kill the Architect and destroy the world. Malus is Xenoblade 2's main antagonist, but even though he does a lot of bad stuff over the course of the game, he's not the story's true villain. Because Malus isn't acting of his own free will. In fact, he doesn't even know his own will. All the rage, hate and contempt that defines Malus at the core comes from an outside source, his driver's mind. Malus's driver is Amalthus, the leader of the Enderline Praetorium. Amalthus was once a good man, but after bearing witness to the horrors of war, he lost his faith in humanity. Amalthus began to see the world as fundamentally unjust, a place of violence, suffering and malice. He climbed the World Tree to seek answers from his creator, but found neither Elysium nor the Architect. Instead, he discovered the course of the two Aegises. Seeking to understand the mind of the Creator, Amalthus awakened the core that would become Malus. And this is where our story truly begins. As we've established, when a new blade is first awakened, much of its nature is drawn from the driver who resonated with its core. Malus believes humanity is unfit to live and has dedicated himself to that purpose. But what Malus doesn't realize is that he's merely carrying out the will of his driver. Poisoned by Amalthus's hatred from the moment of his birth, Malus spent his whole existence waging a lonely war against everyone and everything. He hated the world because he was made to hate the world. He spent his life searching for a meaning behind the destructive impulses he couldn't understand and filled the void with whatever justifications he could conjure up. And when he finally had his answers, he no longer had the strength to turn away from the path he'd walked all those years. Malos can be cheesy, cartoony and larger than life, but that's just a mask that hides the deep-seated confusion and seething self-hatred beneath. And it's the human moments that make him so compelling. The scenes where the mask slips and we get to see the real Malos. In these moments, we see Malos not as the Endbringer or the Master Blade, but as a child that the world failed. Born broken, Malos lived out another man's twisted crusade against a world he never truly knew. Born with a burning hatred of all things, doomed never to know love, joy or trust, Malos never had a chance to live his own life. And that's where compassion comes in. Because more than any other character in this game, Malos deserves a little love. And if Jin did nothing else of worth in all his life, then at least he was Malice's only real friend. Malus and Pyra were both Aegises, but unlike Pyra, Malus never got to realize his true potential. Because for all his strength and conviction, Malus was missing the most important thing. He never had the right driver. Before I go on, I just want to say if you enjoyed this video, I'd be super grateful if you could hit the like button and leave a quick comment, as it really helps the video reach more people. And if you want to support me, consider subscribing to my channel, so I know people want to see more videos like this. Given how much time I've spent complaining about him, it might seem like I can't stand the game's protagonist, Rex. But that's not true at all. Even though Rex is not the kind of hero I wanted to see, he's still a well-crafted character. As a person on the cusp of adulthood, he's sometimes childish and sometimes mature. He can be very naive, but he's also clever, resourceful and surprisingly worldly. He's a natural leader and the way he handles the situation with the thieving kids in Gormat is nothing short of amazing. In a masterstroke of lateral thinking, Rex solves a whole bunch of long-term problems and makes everyone's life a little bit better. But above all, Rex is the perfect hero for Xenoblade 2, because this story is all about trust, and trust is Rex's defining feature. Rex is someone who always looks for the best in other people, 
Even after it literally gets him killed, Rex still chooses to put his trust in the people he meets. He doesn't question motives or search for hidden meanings. He doesn't anticipate betrayal. And most importantly, he doesn't judge people for their past actions. In a more cynical story, a die-hard optimist like Rex would have been crushed by the weight of the world. But not in Xenoblade 2. Because this story is designed to show the healing power of unshakable trust. Rex chooses to trust Pyra, even though he doesn't know the first thing about her. He chooses to trust that Elysium is real, even though no one else believes it. And he chooses to trust that Jin can be saved, that even Malice can be saved. Rex knows his ideals are unreasonable, but he still wants to be a trusting person. He doesn't ignore the bad things that people have done, and he doesn't excuse them. But he believes that people can be redeemed, no matter what. And as hopelessly romantic as that might sound, it's Rex's trust that saves the world. It's no coincidence that the in-game mechanic that measures a blade's affinity is called trust because the bond between Driver and Blade is really just that. Mithra's original Driver, Adam, was a great man and a true hero, but he didn't trust himself with Mithra's power. Missing trust led Mithra to misery, but 500 years later, it was trust that saved her. It's Rex's trust and refusal to judge that convinces Pyra there is a way forward from the trauma of her past that there are people who are willing to love and care for her regardless of what she's done. Rex's relentless cheerleader attitude softens Pyra's heart and turns her away from seeking her own destruction. It's also Rex's blind faith in Jin which redeems the villain. Jin has walked all this way beside Malice because they share the same vision of a rotten world that deserves to be broken. But Rex makes him see there's still people worth saving that drivers and blades can work wonders together, and that maybe, just maybe, the world can be fixed without being broken. And even though Rex was too late to save Malice, he still managed to make his point. In the end, Malice admits that things might have been different if only they'd met sooner. Xenoblade 2's message is that we're better together, but to become more than the sum of our parts, we have to trust each other. Malos believed the bond between Rex and Pyra was their greatest weakness. But what he failed to understand is that our bonds can make us stronger. When we lean on each other, we stand more firmly than we could alone. Without the bond between them, Pyra would have never reached her true potential as the Master Blade, and Rex would have never been the Master Driver. And it was that bond, that trust, that made them stronger than Malice. On my first playthrough, Xenoblade 2's story left me confused and unimpressed. It was only my second pass through the game that taught me to look deeper. Once I did, I saw that all the missing pieces are actually there. You just have to put the puzzle together yourself. And even though the writers could have done a better job telling it, this is still a great story. You just have to work a bit harder than usual to get it. And that's not just true for the story but for pretty much every aspect of the game. Because Xenoblade 2 is not to be taken lightly. Xenoblade 2 is not a great game for casual playthroughs, but it's perfectly suited for passionate players. It's the kind of game that begs you to spend 100 or 200 hours exploring every corner of the world, taking down unique monsters, gathering materials, crafting equipment, grinding affinity charts, and spamming core crystals in the hopes of getting your favorite blades. And when you play the game this way, taking your time instead of rushing the story, all of the serious issues that casual players encounter just go away. The blade bonding system can be a huge time sink if you only pop crystals when you absolutely have to, or if you're dead set on acquiring specific rare blades but it works totally fine if you're casually recruiting blades as you go through the game, without worrying too much about what you end up with. Mandatory field skill checks, like the ones in the Spirit Crucible or the Cliffs of Moritha, can stop you dead in your tracks if you're hurrying through the game, but they're totally trivial if you've already put hours into bonding and developing blades. And some of the game's bosses can be massive roadblocks if you haven't touched the side content. But do a few quests, upgrade your party, and stock up on pouch items, and they're totally fine. 
even Spirit Crucible Elpis, which can be an absolute nightmare for casual players who have relied too much on Pyra and never bothered to master the combat system, becomes more like a clever test of your versatility if you've been playing the game the way the designers intended. Every aspect of Xenoblade 2 is designed around a very clear agenda. The game wants you to be drawn into its vast world and spend countless hours exploring, developing blades and tinkering with the menus. A bunch of the main story quests are specifically designed to introduce the various subsystems, like blade bonding, merc missions, informants and collection spots. The game wants you to have a taste of what's on offer, hoping that once you get the hang of it, you'll be on the hook for more. And even the mandatory field skill checks are probably there for a reason. They're the game's last defense against indifferent players, forcing them to backtrack and do some more content before they proceed. It's a crappy design, but I get where they're coming from. Xenoblade 2 could have done a lot more to ease casual players through the game. And that's really on the designers. Because a lot of potential fans were probably driven away by the game's flaws. But if you can make it past the awful tutorials, confusing combat system and tedious gotcha mechanic, there's a ridiculous amount of game here. This is one of the most grind positive games I've ever played. You can fill out the affinity charts of all your blades, pump their trust levels through the roof, gather a horde of the game's most powerful core chips and aux cores, salvage for rare loot, clear impossible field skill checks, race the town's development levels, complete every merc mission and side quest, and take on stupidly powerful super monsters with your absurdly optimized party. And of course you can gather up a ton of core crystals and spend hours hunting for the game's rarest optional blades. There's enough stuff in there to keep you going for hundreds of hours if you want. Xenoblade 2 is the game that finally made me realize I've kind of lost my way. As a teenager, I squeezed every drop out of Xenogears and Final Fantasy VIII because I didn't want the games to end. And if some parts were endlessly frustrating, I'd just grit my teeth and try even harder. But as I've gotten older and found myself with less time on my hands, the way I engage with these games is totally wrong. Now I play these games to reach the end, and the slightest frustration can kill my vibe. But JRPGs aren't about the destination. They're about getting lost in the journey, and in the best of worlds, those journeys aren't supposed to ever end. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 isn't the game I wanted, but it's a game I've grown to appreciate more and more as time goes by. And it's probably the game the series desperately needed. And if Takahashi and his team had to make some concessions to attract a wider audience, that's okay by me. Because as long as Tetsuya Takahashi is still making games, I'll continue buying them sight unseen. In the end, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is a game about collecting crystals to attract big-breasted waifus with massive swords. And these are just my personal opinions. Whether you agree or disagree, I'd love to hear about your experiences with Xenoblade Chronicles 2 in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.